Welcome everyone to today's webinar with Sustainable Minds and the team from EC3. Uh, this is part of our series, Transparency is the New Green in Product Selection and Specification. And this actually is third in our series this year on using EPDs to make decisions about building products. And this particular webinar is about using EPDs to create actionable information about embodied carbon and construction. Again, really excited to have Stacy, Kate, and Phil with us today, the people instrumental in conceiving and building the EC3 tool. So the agenda for today is uh, I'm going to do an introduction to Sustainable Minds and the work that we've been doing and why uh, a partnership with EC3 and Sustainable Minds uh, makes a lot of sense and is going to offer uh, a lot of great functionality in the marketplace. And then Stacy's going to talk about uh, the impetus for why EC3, how it came about, who's involved. Uh, Kate is going to talk about uh, the methodology, um, which is really uh, so innovative and, and brilliant and really excited for her to be sharing that uh, with this group today. And uh, Phil is going to demo uh, the EC3 tool, which uh, he is the uh, developer. And uh, every other word that goes with creating a, a tool like this, that's Phil. Uh, she's going to give us a great demo. And then I'll show you how uh, we'll be integrating data from EC3 into the transparency catalog and how uh, users will be able to go back and forth between the two platforms uh, to find data and to find products. And we'll have some time for Q&A. So just so that you know, this is being recorded. Everyone will get the link to the recording uh, tomorrow. Um, you can request a PDF of the deck if you like. We will try to get to all the questions that get answered today. And if not, uh, the appropriate folks uh, we'll follow up with you and, and get those answered. So there are a lot of people who are attending this webinar who have attended our previous uh, webinars in the series about EPDs. But for those of you who are new to Sustainable Minds, uh, we're a software company. We've been in the space of building uh, sustainability software since 2007. I'm, I am the founder. And our mission has always been to operate, operationalize environmental performance into mainstream product development and manufacturing to drive revenue and growth through greener product innovation. And so that has played out uh, in two product families. Our first was to bring a streamlined LCA and eco-design software tool to the market uh, in 2010 for product manufacturers of all types, not just building product manufacturers, to help them understand the environmental impacts of their products across the life cycle in early stage design so they could make better decisions about products. And when LEED version 4 was introduced in 2012 with product transparency being a cornerstone concept, when LEED called for manufacturers to use LCA and material ingredient disclosure methods, scientific methods to evaluate the environmental performance and material health of their products. That was when we said, all right, well, we're already in the business of making life cycle assessment more understandable, meaningful, and useful, and simpler for people to be able to use it to make decisions. Now we're going to help building product manufacturers use that same information uh, to make decisions about their products and to help market those products based on environmental performance. We are the only end-to-end -end product transparency solutions provider in the market today. We are a program operator. We deliver technical services and we build software tools uh, to help manufacturers and uh, the architecture, engineering, construction community find those higher performing products uh, in an integrated way. We developed a three-page EPD in 2014 in our effort to uh, make 
environmental performance easier to understand and integrate it with functional performance and the stories that manufacturers are telling uh, about how they're driving performance improvements. What people may not have been aware of until recently is that global warming potential, which is embodied carbon uh, in A1 through A3, have, has always been reported in EPDs, uh, but without a real meaningful way for people to extract that information and use it to make decisions, um, it's data that exists that has not really been uh, actionable in a meaningful way. When we became a program operator, we created the first two-part PCR program for North America, again, to try to create one common set of LCA rules and reporting requirements, rules to create standardized PCRs. And you'll see the reason that I'm giving you this information up front is these are all the challenges that the EC3 team has stepped up to address in a much more accelerated and meaningful way than has been possible up until now. When we launched the Transparency Catalog in 2016, it was always with the intention of being a specification tool so that actually higher performing products can get into the specification. Sustainable Minds, uh, our industry analyst, we track all of the program technical programs, uh, both on the environmental performance and material side, and the catalog has evolved as manufacturers in the industry have created either EPDs or one or more of the types of material ingredient disclosures. In January of 2019, this year, we launched version two of the transparency catalog, where we aggregated and added links to every EPD uh, in North America. And these are the reasons. People said, you know, why are you doing that? Okay, well, because there are so many sources of EPDs and so many variations of EPDs, and they're all mostly still in PDFs. Uh, we need to get everything in one place. Things need to be digitized. And then people need to be able to apply their own product selection criteria. Since January, when we launched the catalog, uh, there were 625 manufacturers in 20 master format divisions. Even in six months uh, since we launched, uh, there were 679 manufacturers uh, in one more master format division with a significant increase in the number of EPDs. So we've seen that not only the trend increase over the years, but just in this year, the number of EPDs and HPDs um, are really dramatically increasing. And we've gotten to a place uh, in the timeline of transparency where really powerful tools can be created because there's enough data, underlying data, uh, to take that data and put them into tools that can be used. And you're going to see what the team's going to talk about today is how to use, how they're using the data that's available today, and the challenges with using uh, the data that's available today. And, you know, for those of you who are feeling like, well, I've really never been able to use EPDs to make decisions, uh, we're here to tell you uh, it's not you, it's us, it's program operators uh, who have been following the ISO 14025 guidance. And in the 14025 guidance, uh, it's very, uh, I'm going to say, uh, ambiguous, although the LCA industry has been very explicit about uh, the language that says, even though EPDs are intended to make, help make comparative decisions, they are not able to make comparative assertions. And so using them to make comparative decisions has been very challenging up until now. And this is why uh, partnering with EC3 and Sustainable Minds, we're exchanging EPD data. We'll be adding uh, the data from uh, the EC3 tool to the transparency catalog listings. And we're going to take the methodology that Kate and the team is developing 
and add it to our technical program to really drive improvements in the quality of PCRs and EPDs uh, to the degree that uh, we're able. So with that introduction, Stacy, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about how this all started and why. Great. Thank you, Terry. Uh, just first of all, excited to be here today to share this with um, this audience and uh, appreciate Terry's leadership of pulling this together and, and partnering with us um, to drive the transparency that we're looking for. Um, so um, I am a sustainability director at Skanska and uh, we first started looking at carbon about five years ago. And, and the way that we start to frame the conversation is, is really the why. Why are we looking at this? What is the impact? And we really need to understand that impact uh, first and foremost. So. These are just slides to kind of ground us in that. Um, first, we know over the next 35 years that two trillion square feet of construction is happening globally. If you go to the next slide, put that into perspective, that's the equivalent of an entire New York City every 35 days for the next 35 years. So if you think about that, I think about all of the building products that we are extracting, manufacturing, transporting, and installing to create that type of um, building stock, if we're not thinking about uh, the environmental impacts of all of those materials that we're putting in place, we're quite frankly being irresponsible. And that's really the starting point for us, and I think a lot of the leaders in our industry that are now participating. We go to the next slide. Uh, the next thing that we have to really understand is the carbon impact of all of those um, building materials and also just the bu building industry in general. So this is a slide that many have probably seen where there's the building operation chunk of the pie, and there's also this building materials and construction chunk. If you click, Terry, what we're going to find um, is that we now know that that building materials and construction chunk actually kind of spilled over into the transportation industry um, industry pieces of the pie. I'm um, thinking about the transportation of materials and some of the manufacturing of those materials. So we're still trying to get our heads wrapped around what that total building material impact may be, and we are learning that it's more than that 11% that we're typically um, used to looking at or, or talking about. If you go to the next slide, um, now that we are framing that, you know, the building sector is a big part of the problem uh, when it comes to carbon emissions, the next thing is understanding where those carbon emissions live. And this is really what's been happening over the past few years is this realization that there are these two uh, sources of carbon uh, in the built environment. One being the operational side, which we're used to talking about and we've been focused on keenly for about 30 years now when we're talking about uh, getting to zero carbon, getting to zero energy, um, codes getting more progressive, all of these things really focus on the operational energy side where it's everything once you flip the light switches on. The other side of things is this embodied carbon bucket that we're here to talk about today and, and tell you what we're doing around that. And that's really everything up to that point. So it's the extraction and manufacturing of all those materials uh, that we're putting into place. It's the transport of those materials to site. And it's the installation of those materials uh, on a construction site. Um, and even beyond that, uh, what EC3 is focused on is really that upfront component of embodied carbon, which is the uh, extraction and manufacturing of all the materials. So we're getting more granular in our understanding of carbon uh, in the built environment and also the dialect uh, of embodied carbon within that. You go to the next slide, Terry. Uh, one of the first things that uh, we have to do is, is frame uh, the associated impacts of these two buckets. So um, this is work that Architecture 2030 put together um, some time ago and started to share, and it really woke Skanska up uh, in terms of what we can uh, actually impact. So we now know that you know, globally, on average, it's somewhere around 50-50 when it comes to impact. If you're taking that 2050 line in the sand of, of getting to zero carbon emissions. Um, so this, this kind of turns things on its head when it comes to how we typically thought about this, where we've been focusing on this operational energy consumption framework. But the embodied carbon that we put in place is there, and it can't be taken back. And we only have, you know, at most um, to 2050 to get to zero. So we need to be focusing on both uh, simultaneously and holistically uh, to get where we need to go to save the planet. Uh, next slide, Terry. Uh, so the question is, now that we understand that these, these um, two buckets of carbon are equally as important, you know, how do we start to really dig into embodied carbon and get caught up um, to the place where we are on the operational side? And the first thing that Skanska did with a couple of partners was fund a research uh, grant to the Carbon Leadership Forum, which you'll hear about from Kate, where we created a benchmark database of carbon footprints of buildings to allow us to see the average. And what you're seeing here is the kilograms of CO2 per square meter, um, taking about a thousand building uh, footprints. So 
we know that these are coming from different tools. Uh, there are different quality controls and quantity controls on the materials estimates, but this is at least giving us a range that's a rough order of magnitude where we can set a high and a low. If you go to the next slide, what SCANSCA started to do about uh, two years ago is take this data and, and start to share it early in the design phase of a project where we just have a square footage and a building type. So looking at a building in Seattle, mid-rise office building, um, if we take that high embodied carbon number from the study and the uh, operational efficiency or EUI that is in our code here in Seattle, which is pretty progressive, plus our clean hydro energy grid, what you're seeing is that over a 50-year life cycle, actually 84% of those emissions are coming from the embodied carbon side of things. Um, it varies per market, obviously. We see in places like Florida, it's still around that 50-50 average that we had assumed in that previous slide. So what this does is start to help our clients and our own uh, commercial development teams um, start to see that there is this um, embodied carbon bucket that is a key problem uh, that we need to start reducing. So because of this, we started uh, getting questions about how Skanska could help our clients reduce that embodied carbon piece of the pie, especially where in places where it was such a big piece of the pie. And that led us to thinking about how we could start to inform uh, material choices in the specifications and procurement phase to drive embodied carbon emissions down of all those materials. So Terry, if you click to the next slide, um, again, to answer this question of what can we do about this, uh, we started to think about what an embodied carbon reduction tool specific to the supply chain and that specifications and procurement phase would look like. And we set up to click a list of kind of a wish list of what that would be if we're trying to um, get the whole industry uh, to transform to low carbon materials. Uh, so this is the list that we came up with. We want something that was available to everyone, easy to use, free to use, open and transparent with an open API. Really all of these things are setting up uh, the ability for it to be uh, widely adopted by industry and take away some of the barriers that existed when it came to tools that were out there um, that are more on the life cycle side of things. And again, keenly focused on supply chain accountability. And that led to us uh, starting a project called the Embodied Carbon and Construction Calculator. Uh, we reached out to Sea Change Labs, a tool developer to come up with a proof of concept and Skanska with our um, owner partner, Microsoft, uh, who has agreed to pilot this on their campus modernization project, seed funded uh, at the proof of concept phase. Once that proof of concept phase uh, led to the tool, we were able to then um, make it a formal project at the Carbon Leadership Forum uh, to gain more industry uh, sponsorship and funding. Um, and Kate will talk more about that in a minute. To go to the next slide, I'm just gonna go through these pretty quickly so we can get to the, the nitty gritty stuff, um, which is vitally important on this webinar. But for us, really, the two things that we need are material quantities. So we get material quantities from a few places right now with EC3. Uh, first and foremost, because it came from Skanska first, the estimating side of things has pretty good quantities because we base them on cost. Um, so you can use your construction estimates to populate the tool if you have them during uh, design and early construction. Autodesk has already uh, funded a, a plugin from um, their platforms where we can actually import um, models to EC3 to get those materials. This is an example of the screenshot uh, that you can get to in the tool. And we also are partnering on the next slide with um, those LCA tools I mentioned, where I think uh, Tally is our first partner, where we can take the quantities and build the materials that designers are using to get to LCA targets, uh, life cycle assessment targets using the Tally tool and import those build materials into the EC3 tool to follow the chain through um, specification and procurement. So that's how we're getting the information into the tool. And then when it comes to the data, and Kate will go into the methodology behind EPDs, we are using environmental product declarations on the next slide, Terry. Um, and this is the example that um, I've been using for a long time when it comes to what an EPD is. Uh, a lot of people on the call probably understand this already, but it is a place where we can get basically a serving size and a total, carb total carbohydrate of uh, a building material. So it, it's kind of like a um, nutrition label, but if you click Terry, what um, Kate will say, and I've learned is that it's actually more like a miles per gallon where you see that stick, that number on the side of your car and you know that it's gonna go up and down based on efficiency and optimization and, and things. So um, it really is more like this. It's not a static number. Um, and Kate will go into how we're addressing that in a minute. So go to the next slide. Um, what all of this is really trying to do is drive supply chain accountability. So in my cartoon, you know, my cartoon graphic here, uh, what we're looking at is the environmental impacts per material category, being able to assess suppliers and manufacturers using those EPD numbers with uh, CLS methodology attached and really drive down emissions. And we're testing this now based on data in EC3 on our pilot projects and finding that we can achieve a 30% reduction in emissions just by having the data and asking at no cost. Um, that's where we currently are. 
Um, so we're proving this out as we build the tool. Uh, next slide. And just my final uh, bit is that we're seeing this adopted widely and interest across the board when it comes to a pilot credit being uh, developed by CLS Skanska for, uh, for LEAD, uh, by LBC looking at adopting um, the methodology and limits that CLS is setting into their um, certification programs, and then a whole bunch of code work uh, and health policy work happening from by clean acts to um, how this could look in an actual um, jurisdictional code. So all this is coming. We're trying to align this all very quickly, and we want to make sure we're all talking the same language and looking at the same data to do so. If you go to the next slide, I think I'm done. <laughs> DC3 just flew up in the corner. Oh, this is a little bit of inspiration. Yep, my little bit of inspiration is that I think that based on all this happening so quickly and the ability for industry to pick this up, that it's going to be policy and our industry really leading the way and driving us to, to low and no carbon materials. Thanks, Stacey. That um, is quite the journey that you started and we're on now. And please, Kate, take it away and let's dive deep into the technical back end. Great. Thank you, Stacey and Terry. So I'm here representing the Carbon Leadership Forum, and we're a, uh, a what could arguably the largest network of uh, architects, engineers, builders, owners, material suppliers, policymakers, all focused on uh, reducing embodying carbon or the carbon impact of materials and buildings. And we've de developed together research and resources that are necessary to inform and empower our members and building a collaborative network, the Embodied Carbon Network. Some of you might be members of that as well. It's really inspiring and connecting our members to enact change. And this has resulted in member-led initiatives, including the EC3 tool, as Stacy shared, how it, how it developed. Let's see. And we see all of this fitting into a broader market transformation strategy. Our goal is to enable low carbon materials to successfully compete in the market. And therefore, we need to raise awareness through education, align data, and deliver the tools and resources for people to act. That's what we'll be talking about here today. But then additionally, as Stacy mentioned, these, this data and tool needs to be implemented into effective policy ranging from a green building rating system to a, a building code. While we're focused on eliminating the embodied carbon in buildings, step four in this slide, uh, we see that this is integrated into a needs to be integrated into a comprehensive strategy so that the building sector can re, um, meet global climate targets. So, so the Carbon Leadership Forum is focused on point four, but connecting to all the other groups that are uh, uh, advancing uh, of these other vital threads. So as Stacy mentioned, one of the most exciting parts of the Embodied Carbon Construction Calculator a project is the team of people that have come forward to support and advance the project. So in addition to the sponsors shown up here, we have a total of over 30 organizations, including Sustainable Minds, at, who are helping to advance the methodology and technological uh, innovation of the project. As Stacy mentioned, this is the engagement on the EC3 project came directly out of some research in which we started to on, uh, first characterize the order of magnitude of embodied carbon. Based on this study, which compiled, compiled over a thousand buildings, we are able to start saying things like the estimate of embodied carbon is between 500 and 1,000 kilograms per square meter. That gives Stacy and Skanska the tools to put their buildings in context. But as we look to understand and reduce embodied carbon in buildings, we see that there's really three scales. Uh, the first at a big um, high level macro scale is deciding which project to build or even to build a project to begin with. So this is where decisions like renovating a building or um, building a new, how large of a house do you need uh, come into play and good rules of thumb can help enable that. Uh, if you build half as much building, you have about half as much embodied carbon. The next scale of uh, optimization is around building systems. Do I build a concrete or a steel building? Do I make my wall out of metal studs or straw bale? And th at that time, at the system level, you really have to take a comprehensive life cycle perspective to make sure that you're addressing all of the differences in use and in phase impact. Existing whole building LCA tools are on the way to help people make those system optimization choices. 
But the last stage about optimizing specification and procurement, once I know I want steel studs, how do I get the lowest carbon steel stud? Uh, that's the part where we saw the biggest need in the market. And that's where EC3 is aimed to address. Uh, so in the EC3 tool, there's really two main components. One is estimating material quantities, and the other is connecting those material quantities to uh, material types, so either cat classes of materials uh, or a specific product, and then giving actionable data. So you can see here on the slide, um, there's a, on the structural steel zone here, there's a light orange zone. That's capturing the opportunities for improvement within the structural steel category. And those wrap up to the overall building scale to show the opportunities for improvement within the building. So this, it means that we have to lean on whether or not EPDs are comparable. And as Stacy mentioned, there are some uh, challenges with EPDs and we're working to work, move from what we see as the current state of EPDs in which data is in PDFs, they're hard to use, there's no variability reported in them, and they're idiosyncratic and inconsistent. We envision a future state where the data is transferred digitally, it's easy for people to use, there's clear statistical variability, and everything is aligned and updated. So our goal, one of the foundational goals of the EC3 uh, tool is to make EPDs more comparable. And if you look at um, uh, ISO 21930, so that's the standard focus specifically on EPDs for building products, it, it does go through the possibility for comparison. So those comparisons are possible if some things are met. So if you go through the uh, standard, there's uh, general categories around the function of the product, the amount of the product, and the LCA methods used. So in order for EPDs to be comparable, we can't expect building industry professionals to go through and make all of these comparisons. EC3 is looking to drive um, closer to comparison by the development of methodology to evaluate those EPDs. So we have, um, working together with our core partner, Sea Change Labs, developed and refined methodology proposed uh, that is being implemented in the version one of EC3. So there's a general methodology and then individual reports for each of the different material categories about how to address the core aspects of comparability that are needed in order to um, conform with the ISO standards. A key new um, concept that we are using, we are terming the burden of the doubt methodology. The primary aspect of the burden of the doubt methodology is that we are not defaulting to average, we're taking a conservative approach and assuming that we are, have um, the, the worst case version of the assumption rather than an average assumption. So we have two, two key things that we're addressing. Uh, one is we're setting uh, um, a high value uh, of, or a limit that we are approximating to estimate the 80th percentile of the market and an achievable limit, um, which we say is representing 20% of the market. If you, if you are specifying something at this, quote, achievable 20% rate, we will expect that at least 20% of the markets are products in the market are available, and therefore uh, one is, can presume that you will be able to still get a competitive pricing. If you um, dive into the tool itself, so here's a mock-up, a markup of the tool in its development stage. You look into the tool details, you'll see that there's information about the category as a whole, as well as the product specific. So what we're displaying to users is first off, uh, what is their, what is the estimate of the limit of 80% of the market? And what are the available products in the market today? So the green bar is the products available today. The red bar would be a, uh, is the static number that the EC3 methodology is defining for each of the different product categories. Additionally, the product specific that you're looking at here, products report EPD results, uh, embodied carbon results, as a single number, but anybody who has access to the background data of an LCA knows that there is some variability and uncertainty inherent in that data. And we are daylighting an estimate of that uncertainty and defaulting using the burden of the doubt methodology to assume the highest number in that uncertainty rather than the, um, the 
effectively average or most likely number assumed in an EPD. In evaluating EPDs, we have four key metric, um, criteria. First, it needs to be something that's simple, easy for people to apply and use. Second, transparent, uh, that it can be clearly defined. It does not need to be a simple method. It can be a complex and sophisticated method, but it needs to be simple for people to use. It needs to be consistent so that it can be applied across all product categories and EPD types the same and motivate to incentivize higher quality data in the future. I'm going to give a fairly quick overview of this here, uh, and I would welcome anybody else who would be interested in learning more. Uh, there are opportunities to engage. So first off, when a, a program operator accesses how the EPD is represented in the EC3 tool, they are able to see directly here on this slide where we're assessing the uncertainty in their product. So there, if it is manufacturer specific, there is less uncertainty than an industry average data, for example. We are importing data into the EC3 tool in three main ways. One, by scanning EPDs. Secondly, by manually enter them. And then optimally, we're getting digital data transfer. So Climate Earth is a, uh, an LCA provider for concrete EPDs, and they've instigated digital transfer. So there's automatic upload of every new EPD directly into EC3. I'm going into statistics, so you can either enjoy or not, uh, but we're uh, building up estimates of uncertainty uh, based on five different variables. Is because these variables can be considered independent, we can sum up those uncertainties using a root mean square method, and we're assessing these five factors that are assessed here. So that means that, the, that with each of the different EPDs, there's a flowchart of evaluation that says, for example, is the EPD manufacturer specific? Yes, it has a low variability. No, it has a higher variability. Right now, we have just default low and high numbers here, and we're looking for information from experts in each of the different material categories to identify uh, if there are reasons within a category that these defaults are, are, should be different, and even if these are appropriate estimates for general, uh, general use. I'm not going to go through the details of estimating variability, but I'm just going to go a quick overview. If you wanted to estimate the 80th percentile, you need to have a probability distribution function. You need to know both the global warming potential embodied carbon of a product and how much product is produced. Uh, if we um, there's if we are given standard deviation, we can make um, decisions uh, only if we have a normal distribution. And within the building product space, we know that there are many different um, um, product types in which there are is not a normal distribution of production volume. And in fact, what we have in EC3 is we have data that only tells us the embodied carbon. We have no idea of what the production volume is. So we have um, need to figure out ways to approximate this, quote, 80th percentile or this high limit that we're using. We have two ways in which we're doing it. One, when we think the EPDs represent the entire industry, um, and they're something like carpet, where we have lots of EPDs for most of the manufacturers. Then we're assuming that all the production is the same volume, and we just take 20% of the market and clip it off based on the data in EC3. There are other sectors such as structural steel in which we know that the EPDs don't re represent the full industry. And that's made apparent by the fact that all the EPDs that are produced are at or below the average. Uh, so none of the high manufacturers are currently reporting. Therefore, we need to figure out a way to estimate the 80th percentile relying on high industry average S data uh, that's publicly re released. So the foundational principles of the actions we're taking in EC3 is to rely on publicly available data and to make methods that works with that data. However, if uh, the uncertainty and variability is reported in an EPD, that data will um, supersede the defaults that EC3 is um, using. So our goal is that we are um, driving to a point where the data around uncertainty 
is reported in EPDs, but not waiting until that exists. Uh, to act. Oh, I think am I? So there's um, uh, ways for you to um, uh, engage. If you want to learn more about the Embodied Carbon Movement, you can join the Carbon Leadership Forum. You can send me an email, and we'll add you to our email list. Uh, you can sign up for access to the tool. It's not going to be available to the public until November, but if you put your name there, you'll be sure to get an email when it opens up. And we are still looking for additional support for the EC3 tool. So we uh, are looking for sponsors to help us move forward, uh, the technology partners, uh, which Sustainable Minds is one of them, as well as uh, people to um, give feedback on the uh, developing methodology. Uh, in particular, we're looking for better data from across all the material sectors. So our goal is to build an open source embodied carbon data ecosystem. We need your help. Um, please reach out if you uh, um, have any ideas. Now I'm passing it on. Yes, thank you, Kate. Okay, and now with all of that explanation, uh, we're gonna take you over to the browser and turn it over to Phil, and Phil is going to take you through how to use EC3. And in fact, Phil, one question we got, which you're going to answer is, uh, how do you use EC3 without Tally? So right. buckle up, Phil's gonna take you through the tool. Awesome, I'll definitely answer that question. Um, so my name is Phil Northcott. I lead uh, Sea Change Labs, which is a cloud software company uh, focused on sustainability and the war against climate change in particular. Um, this tool is still in beta. We're very much looking forward to November the 19th when we are going to be both uh, releasing this uh, tool for general use uh, and making it open source uh, so that other companies can uh, use all of this source code in order to further improve it and contribute to the community and also uh, develop their own derivatives as well. It's got four basic tools in it. The first is a search tool that uh, looks into our database and finds materials uh, based on performance and uh, embodied carbon. There's a building planner, which is fundamentally a, a big cost model. Uh, but for embodied carbon rather than money. Uh, and then there's a set of tools that are uh, built around uh, helping manufacturers and program operators uh, manage the EPDs that are in the system, uh, which have been digitized through our process. So let's get started with uh, going into a material. And I like to start with concretes because that's where we have the most. Um, concrete is obviously quite a complex material. In fact, every material in this tool is, is moderately complex. So for each material, we've created a set of industry-specific um, search terms. So for example, here we have compressive strength at 28 days. Uh, so I'm going to put it in as, say, 5 KSI. You can also do megapascals or PSI. Uh, you, you, you can pick other curing times up to 120 days. Uh, you can pick options like air entrainment and so on. Um, and most importantly, uh, you can pick a geography. Uh, you can, for example, in this case, I'll pick Washington State um, and let's say Oregon. Oops, <laughs> Washington State and uh, Oregon. And you can choose pretty much anywhere uh, in North America and, and get a certain amount of results. Now, when we've done this search, what did it tell us? Well, there were 255 mixes that met our criteria, uh, and they have a range of embodied carbon per cubic yard, which is the declared unit here. So let's take a look at the results. What it told us was the absolute minimum it found was around 90 kilos of CO2e per cubic yard. Uh, the maximum was 612. But those are probably not that interesting. 80% of the mixes fall between 251 and 342 kilos of CO2e per cubic yard. 
So if you're not too careful about your procurement, you'll get around 340. But there's at least 20% of the mixes out there uh, that are 250 kilos or lower, which suggests that if you spec put that in your spec, you're likely to be able to get it uh, at uh, a reasonable cost. Similarly, if you're a manufacturer, you should know for your region, this is the number to shoot for uh, if you want to be competitive. If you're interested in how those break out, you can uh, take a look at this comparison. So this here is, this is the same graph you saw before. And then for each of the manufacturers that have uh, EPDs in our system that are in this region and that match the search criteria we have just put in, uh, you can see the range of products from each manufacturer that satisfy these um, results. One caveat for anyone listening to this is this is based on the, the data we have in the system. Of course, uh, that's uh, all the data that we currently have. So where does this data actually come from? Well, it comes from environmental product declarations, which are generally in a PDF format. And what we do is we digitize them. So in this case, I think uh, this one was prepared by, this EPD was prepared by Climate Earth. Uh, it's under the ASTM uh, program, and uh, it was declared by Stoneway. I've chosen it arbitrarily. Uh, you can see some important uh, stuff about this uh, product, but the most important thing to see is uh, that uh, here is the category, which is concretes, and this is where this product lands. And around the declared value, uh, you can see this blue fuzzy patch. That fuzz represents the uncertainty in uh, the EPD estimate. Um, we know that it's manufacturer specific. We know that it's plant specific. We know that it's product specific. So that actually makes for a fairly tight distribution uh, of about 25% in this case. Where does the remainder come from? We don't know where the, the cement came from. We don't know where the aggregates came from because those aren't declared. And we know there's a batch to batch variation of around 15%. Um, so that's the remaining uncertainty. If you were looking at an industry EPD, none of these things would be true and the uh, uncertainty would be significantly greater. That uncertainty is applied uh, before we do comparisons, because at the end of the day, we cannot compare usefully the result that is in the EPD, but we can compare usefully what's the value that we are at least 80% certain the real product is better than. And that gives us some confidence in our uh, comparisons. We have digitized about 16,000 EPDs so far, uh, and uh, a special shout out to, um, uh, to Climate Earth, uh, wh who have been supplying us with EPDs that we don't have to digitize. We actually get, uh, intake them directly from their database. And that's a, a model that we see uh, being very important in the future. I should mention that in all of these cases, if you want to see the EPD, you can download it uh, from our system and look at the original. So the second big piece we've got here is the building planner, which is essentially a contractor's cost model. Um, it was derived from uh, Skanska's cost model with uh, the input of a whole bunch of our, uh, excuse me, structural engineering and architecture advisors who walked us through what they really needed uh, in a tool like this. So we start apart from the name with an address. And the address is very important because that's what allows us to determine uh, what materials are actually local and reasonable to bring in. Uh, we've got some statistics here around the uh, building and most importantly, the gross floor area, which lets us 
calculate an intensity, how much CO2 per uh, square foot or, or square yard or square meter of usable floor area is this. That helps us compare between buildings. The uh, model, it, the cost model itself is built out of a set of building elements organized in a uniformat, which is a, a very common uh, um, contractor's format, and then quantities, which can be edited uh, either just by putting in the numbers uh, in the way you would normally do material takeoffs or uh, early construction estimates, uh, or using mathematics. Uh, and if you, uh, if you want, uh, if you have a BIM model, you can actually import your quantities from the BIM model to the extent that the BIM model you have represents uh, reasonable takeoffs for the actual building. Uh, you can also put your own notes into each one of these uh, in case you want to make notes about where your estimates came from uh, or anything else about uh, the uh, uh, about that field. So once you've uh, got all of these complete, uh, you can go ahead and do a visualization. So what this does here is it says, well, here are all of the different kinds of materials. Here are the different uniformat classes, uniformat level one classes, and the building as a whole. In each case, you can see that uh, there is a conservative estimate, which is uh, the 80th percentile of all materials uh, in, in that search. There's the achievable target, um, and we give you an idea of where the savings are, which lets you decide where do you want to focus your effort uh, in terms of uh, sourcing low carbon materials and where does it not make as much difference. So when you do create a building, whether it's by importing from a, a BIM model uh, or by uh, starting your own, it always uh, starts as a uh, private building. Uh, and that's important because uh, you will want to, you may wish to share it. So let me just back up here so you can see. So what you can see here is that each of these buildings is public, which means it's been shared with the user group public. Uh, when you create a building project uh, and save it, you will uh, then be able to share it with people um, if you wish, or even publicizing it by sharing it with the group public. The uh, oops, geography. Um, so one of the key things that we can do here, let's just go into, I don't know, rebars, uh, is we can uh, sort uh, by geography. And in the case of a building, we can actually do it by distance from an address. When we, uh, so let's just pick a, a different one here. Let's pick flooring, for example, or ceiling tiles, actually. Um, so if we take a look at ceiling tiles, and this is just an un, uh, unconstrained search of everything that's here, uh, you can see a wide variety of values. And if we, you can filter, for example, by manufacturer. And you can do that by plant and geography or by, you know, things in the name of the description. You can always go into any of these and take a look at its EPD. Uh, and in the case of ones where uh, there is a entry in the transparency catalog, you can go ahead and click there, which will take you to the product page, uh, which in this case is Armstrong Ceiling Solutions uh, on the transparency catalog. Still on. I'm going to demo the version that has the EC3 data integrated into it. Fantastic. So I will. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the last last statement I'm going to make is that it's very important as an industry that we create an ecosystem of tools that work with each other and exchange data. Um, time is not our friend, 
to a, solve the climate crisis, uh, but uh, there is an enormous amount of ingenuity and goodwill out there um, if we can uh, organize as a community and uh, get all of our best uh, ideas uh, working in roughly the same direction. And with that, I'm going to turn over to uh, Terry. Well, thank you, Phil. And what we're going to show you uh, now is in the EC3 tool, uh, Phil and the team uh, have made it possible to model the embodied carbon impacts of buildings in a particular geography um, with an underlying methodology that's, that's very robust and uh, will continue to get more robust as more data gets created and provided. And so one of the things that uh, we, we've done and will be continuing to do for EC3 is to provide access and links to every EPD uh, from every program operator in, in North America organized by master format division. And so now this is where we get to the last mile because uh, you can use a modeling tool to make decisions and find the best products. Uh, you can import from uh, CAD tools to make that easy to model. But the last mile is making sure that those products from that manufacturer actually get into the spec uh, and uh, you know, potentially uh, use that data to define the basis of design uh, and make sure that the con contractor, and we don't have to worry about Skanska and some of the others, but making sure that those products that get into the spec that do have uh, the highest environmental performance or the least embodied carbon impact are the, are the products and materials that get used because that's the only way we're going to build actually higher performing buildings. So, so the transparency catalog uh, is designed as a specification tool and what you're able to do is find every single building product manufacturer in North America who's invested in EPDs or material ingredient disclosures. You can filter and search by master format division. So for example, if I want to if I'm uh, in an early stage of a project and I'm doing research on, on products and maybe it's a lead project, um, I can come to the transparency catalog. It's free to use. There's no login and just find out, well, how many manufacturers in Division 9 uh, have EPDs and or material ingredient disclosures. And I'm going to find there's a lot. There's a lot of brands. There's a lot of products. I can even then say, all right, well, show me all the ones that uh, are going to help me earn the EPD credit. And I can uh, ultimately scan up and down that, that list and see uh, who has EPDs, who has HPDs. I can, I can uh, obviously start looking now by section. Um, and so I want to focus in on, on the Armstrong ceilings uh, listing because here's the filtered results and you can see all the brands who actually meet the criteria that you're filtering on. But say you're interested in, in Armstrong as a brand, you can go here to the Armstrong listing and what you're going to find uh, is the ability to contact them, the ability to find every single product they have in every master format division and section with transparency information, go to the, manu go to the page on the manufacturer's website, um, get directly to the EPD, the declare labels, et cetera. Uh, but now when we've integrated uh, the EC3 data, uh, what you're going to find is not only will you be able to come uh, and see the EPD and get to the EPD, you'll be able to see the uh, information in EC3. And so when I click here, uh, I'm going to be taken to the EPD page in EC3 uh, for more information and actually even be able to start to model a project uh, right from there. Now, what I want to show you is this tool tip that we've spent a lot of time uh, trying to take all of the complexity 
of that methodology, all of the aggregation of the data, the averaging, and be able to very simply, in a glance, be able to let a user know uh, not only uh, is there an EPD for that product, but uh, how does that product-specific EPD result compare to uh, the industry uh, level uh, that uh, EC3 has set. So what we've done to make that uh, consumable in a glance is uh, Phil uh, has spent a lot of time wor working with us to ultimately roll up uh, those comparisons uh, into a scale. Uh, so it's not a rating system, it's simply a comparability scale that's going to tell you based on the data in that EPD compared to the EC3 product class, where does it fall? And then you're able to get that methodology, read that, log into uh, buildingtransparency.org. And when we roll this out in November uh, with the launch of EC3, you'll see that not all products will have EC3 data, even if they have an EPD. Uh, there's a certain number of product categories that will be rolled out initially with EC3, but even when uh, the product might be in that category, if there's not data in that EPD uh, that is quality data or enough data to provide that comparison, then it won't be displayed. Anyway, uh, we wanted to give you kind of the big picture of what's coming and uh, this really big, important, integrated strategy. Uh, EC3 has done an amazing job of mobilizing pretty much all sectors of the industry to engage in a way uh, that we will start making a real impact on reducing embodied carbon impacts uh, in the built environment now. Uh, and giving people tools to be able to do that. There is a, a handful of questions that have come in. Uh, I think we've answered some of them. Uh, for those of you who have a couple more minutes, uh, we'll answer a few of them now. Uh, but we will, uh, for those we don't answer, we, we will follow up in an email. And um, I'm going to go to an easy one right right now. and. Uh, any one of you can take this because I think it's important to clarify what embodied carbon is. So someone asked, will pre-manufacture, sorry, uh, does the carbon calculator for delivery to the project site, does the calculator account for the delivery to the project site? And the answer is I'll, it doesn't today, but it will. Okay. And my, so my, uh, and my add-on to that, my, my add-on to that would be that the reason that it hasn't been a focus yet is because we know that it's only about 2 to 5% of the emissions impact when you compare to the manufacturer of the material itself. So we will get there, but it's not our keen focus of where we need to act first. Right. Okay, great. Uh, will pre-manufactured wall assemblies be included in the EC3 tool? Uh, I not eventually. First, not, not at this time. Well, well, yeah, one, we, our hope is that we will continue the project and the tool development um, post November to include more material categories and get input from the industry of, of what to do next. It will not be part of the first release. So, Stacy, here's a question for you. Um, for Skanska, what percent of your construction projects are operated solely on renewables, either on site or purchase? Kind of a side question. Is that a question about the, the buildings themselves or our site, our construction practices? That would be my clarification. I mean, right now what we're doing is assessing our site emissions when it comes to what we can um, put to renewables from a, from a site construction perspective. Uh, the buildings themselves are really dictated by the owners um, that we're working for, and that's where we can inform them and hope to push them towards both renewable energy, clean energy, and lower embodied carbon products. I'm not sure if that answers the question. Yeah, whoever asked that, if you have a follow-up, we'll send that to Stacy and we'll get that back to you. Um, 
I think we've provided so much information to the audience. Uh, the questions are um, broad, right? So uh, here's one question about industry-wide EPDs, and I suspect it's from the manufacturer who is asking, is there a disadvantage of using an industry-wide EPD? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, there are, in our tool, uh, there's a disadvantage in that uh, because we don't know exactly which manufacturer, plant, or product, uh, we have to account quite a large uncertainty for that, and the burden of the doubt is placed against the product uh, that uses industry PD. I think as and a I would add th there's a, a real purpose for this because ultimately the people who make decisions on you know that are going to affect the carbon intensity of the products uh, you know when they do something better uh, they need a business case to do that they need to be recognized for that in a timely way so that there's a business case for doing better uh, and that requires accountability for the carbon to be uh, at you know specific plants specific product lines and from the user perspective, as a user, if I'm a, if I'm a contractor trying to procure a low carbon product, I, if there's a manufacturer that is disclosed, I'm going to pick that manufacturer or want to go towards that manufacturer versus a manufacturer that's given to an industry average because they're being more transparent about their particular number. So there's a market, a market business case um, for any manufacturer to be incentivized to do that because of how these things are now being assessed and compared. I want like to add so just to, that that is all in context yeah. of comparing building materials. That's not to negate the value of industry organizations creating industry average EPDs, right. because that that helps us understand the spread of the market. And so industry average LCA studies are really useful in putting in context of whole building life cycle assessment. I think just a missing piece of those averages is that um, understanding of the range of data behind the average. So some industries are very tight, almost all manufacturers the same, others are broad. The industry average EPD should demonstrate the uncertainty and variability with it that's in, encapsulated in that average number. Right, right. So Kate, I'm glad you added, added that because there are a lot of manufacturers who are small, uh, don't necessarily have the budget or the bandwidth to invest in their own product-specific EPDs today. But part of this initiative, as all of us spoke about earlier, is to streamline and make it simpler uh, to create PCRs, to do EPDs, to generate the data, and for manufacturers to be able to have that information for themselves to make actually better performing products. So as a, a wrap-up, uh, Stacey, Kate, Phil, do you have a closing statement you'd like to make? Thank you very much. Thank you. We're excited. All right, thank you.